Guys, can you believe summer is almost over? Because I can't. I literally do not know where the year went. All of a sudden it's almost September and I'm kind of shook, I'm not gonna lie. And though I'm really sad to see all the summer romance go, I am very excited for fall because I love like the mystery and thriller and creepy crawly books that we'll be able to get to read soon. So before we get ahead of ourselves, I do want to go over all the books that I read in July and in August. And in total, I read eight books for both of those months. Like in total, I read eight books. And though that is like on pace for my goal with Goodreads, I do feel like I was kind of reading slow these last two months. I don't know. It wasn't necessarily a book slump, but it wasn't really like a vibe either, you know? So I'm a little sad about that, but I'm hoping this change in weather and season and genre of reading material will really get me back to where I was before. So without further ado, let's go over the books that I read in July. Now in July, I read about four books. So I read four in July and I read four in August. So not bad, but not like terribly amazing either. The first book I read in July was Panika. I gave Panika a four star rating and this book was about this guy. It starts off with him being in his early fifties and he's having this excruciating, almost debilitating headache. And then he goes to see a doctor and he realizes that this chronic headache that he keeps getting that he calls the iron mask is actually a terminal situation and he just deals with that fact at such an uh, early age I know he's like a little bit older but he still has half of his life ahead of him ideally so he's dealing with the fact that he may not be here as long as he would like to be and it's sad because he just started to get his life kind of back together because when he was younger he was like in a football team and he and his team were almost to the finals and then he was the last person to hit the goal or almost hit the goal and he made this huge mistake and it cost them the game obviously and the chance to be champions and then his whole team his whole city kind of just turned against him and he's been dealing with that mistake and he hasn't made that mistake his identity for the last 25 years but just as he's starting to get out of it his town is about to be champions again because of this new team he's starting to get his life back together and then he finds out he has this terminal illness and I don't know why, I know it kind of sounds very mundane, it's just talking about his daily life, but for some reason the simplicity of that was just so refreshing to me. I think a lot of times we read books and they, there's always a happy ending or happy-ish ending, but this book was very unique because it kind of just shows how life is. Sometimes you can want the best for your life, do the best that you can, and it still doesn't end up the way that you want it to. And you can never decide when you're gonna be here or how long you're gonna be here, how long you're gonna have with your loved ones. And it was just so, honest and raw and it was very like it was very heartbreaking honestly because I, I was rooting for him and the book kind of ended abruptly like he just started liking this new girl she was in her 40s she was a hairdresser and you see him falling in love having this great connection with his daughter again that he hadn't talked to for most of her life because he let that mistake uh, with the football team just take over his life but then he started talking to her again and her son and then all of a sudden you know what's coming and it's just so sad because it's just not fair, but life isn't fair sometimes. And I think the important lesson that I got from this book is the fact that it's so important to be open and to be vulnerable and allow people in because you don't know how long you'll have. Even though I hated that it ended kind of abruptly, now thinking back to it, I feel like I kind of enjoyed that. It kind of reminds me of like, if you're ever on the subway and you talk to someone random and you find out their life story up until that present moment, and then you kind of want to know what's going to happen next, but you never see that person again. That's the vibe that it left me with. And I wasn't mad at it. It was very enjoyable. So we started off the month very strong. Now, next up was another good book. It was my first fantasy in a very long time. And that is Fourth Wing. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. No, you guys aren't ready. No. You're not ready, you're not ready. I don't know if it's because I haven't read a fantasy book in so long, but this right here, this right here, it was amazing. It was so good. And she's a little thick book, okay? And I was zooming past it. I don't know if it was because I was reading it on my Kindle or because the story was so good, but I was zipping, zipping through this book. It was so amazing. Let me just tell you what it's about. <laughs> So this book is about Violet. She is a 20 year old who's been training her whole life to be a scribe. She's about to go to like their version of college, but then her dad passes away and her mother, who's like a military figurehead, has decided, you know what, we don't have time for you to be a scribe. 
we need you to be a dragon rider. Which is one of the most dangerous schools that she can go to. It is the most dangerous school that she can go to. And she hasn't been properly trained. She's very small, she's not very muscular, and her mom is basically setting her up to die because she thinks more about her image and her pride than about her daughter and what her daughter wants because her daughter only wanted to be a scribe and stay in the footsteps of her father. But as she goes to this dragon school, it's basically like you either survive or you die and she thrives. Yes, she goes through it with some scrapes and bruises, some broken bones, but she is so determined and so strong-minded. It's just so, it was so refreshing. It was so cool to see. I thoroughly enjoyed her personality. I love seeing her character development too because at first she was kind of scared, shy, but like wouldn't back down. Then after a few trials and tribulations, she became so strong, not only mentally, but physically as well. And there was an enemies to lovers trope and you guys know I am a sucker, sucker for an enemies to lovers trope. And they just had the best relationship. I didn't like him at first, but then I was like, yeah, I think I like Zayden. Yeah, I do. And then her best friend was there too and then you had to deal with their relationship it was very complex but I thoroughly enjoyed it again I don't know if it's because I haven't read a fantasy in so long but I was gripped by this book I was so into it every night before I go to bed I try to read for like 30 minutes I would be reading for like an hour hour and a half just trying to figure out what's gonna happen next it was so good there was no boring parts everything made sense and one of the things that I love the most about this book is the fact that when she was developing this fantasy world she wasn't just throwing us facts I'm talking about the author she said it through the words and the thoughts of Violet the main character and I just thought that that was so refreshing because I think the reason why I kind of stray away from fantasy is because they always have to build up the world it's always so political and that kind of stuff is boring to me but the way that she just put it into the book through Violet's perspective it was very cool very very cool I really love this book four star read the only reason why it wasn't a five star read is because there was just some cheesy lines like when it got spicy ah uh, I just hate I hate that sometimes I hate it it just it feels like it's throwing cold water on me because I'm all into the book I'm all into the vibes and then they just say something I'm just like why? <laughs> but besides that, it was very good. I cannot wait till the second one comes out and I believe it comes out this fall. So you know we are reading it. I cannot wait. We may even read that for a 24 hour readathon. And after Fourth Wing, it literally just kept getting better. And that was because of book number three, The House and the Cerulean Sea. This was an easy, easy five star read for me. It definitely went into the vault for one of my all time favorite books. It was just so incredible and so deep there was just so much character development so much depth for each character it was incredible so let me explain the main character's name is linus baker linus baker is basically a caseworker but for magical children so he goes around different facilities and he just tries to determine if they're good enough to stand based on the government's restrictions and guidelines he takes his job very very seriously he lives a very black and white very very vanilla life he doesn't do anything but work he literally hasn't gone on vacation in years and he just likes it that way. He's kind of a loner. He doesn't talk to anyone. He doesn't talk to his neighbors. All he really has is his black and white life and his very devious cat. <laughs> but that all changes when he goes to see the house in the Cerulean Sea. Now he is chosen for this special mission because of his objectivity. He's very like by the book. He does not listen to his opinions or his thoughts or emotions. He strictly goes by the rules and the guidelines. And so the higher ups noticed that about him and decided he was the right man for this job. Now when Linus gets to the house, he immediately meets the six children they're very peculiar and they're very very adorable they all have very distinct personalities and you just fall in love with them immediately but he also meets the master of the house who just happens to be quite attractive and also just as endearing now as the story unfolds Linus begins to get really close to the children as well as the master and then you get to see each one of the kids and like their own personalities what they enjoy what they've been through what they've endured and it was just so endearing and just so heartwarming to see the children open up to Linus even though he was so strict so by the book he was not playing around he never let his emotions judge how he's going to judge a property but they slowly start breaking down his barriers and he immediately falls in love with them he doesn't realize it but you as the reader realizes it and it's just so beautiful and it's not just him falling in love with these children these children are falling in love with him trusting him even though he came under the pretense of like taking them away from their home, the home that they developed together. So it was just really cool to see both sides just slowly break down their walls and find love with each other. And it was just, <laughs> it 
It was so beautiful. It was literally so perfect. I think it was so impactful for me because this book wasn't just talking about flowers and rainbows and just everyone being kumbaya. No, they had to go through some really serious trials and tribulations together. But it's the fact that they endured and fought for what was right. Because even though this book is just talking about magical realism, it's the fact that they're really discussing discrimination and prejudice and judging a book by its cover. And then they fight for what's right, no matter how much pushback they got. And they got a lot of pushback, by the way, which I also really enjoyed because it's like real life. When you fight an injustice, it doesn't just magically go away and we're all happy now. No, you have to constantly fight for it. Not everyone's going to see right from wrong. And this book really touches home on that. And I think what I really, really love about this book, and I feel like it was a very sneaky way of putting it in, this book is all about fighting injustices, not judging a book by its cover, and seeing that there's more to someone than just the surface or just the stereotypes that society has put over them. The author also puts all of these lessons to the test by making Linus gay, and it shows him finding love. And then it's like, if you are already going into this book, kind of like, homophobic or not really open to those ideas, when you read it through this pretense, you see how ridiculous it is for a society to be judging these beautiful, very complex children, resilient children. And then they make you use those lessons in real life and face your own stereotypical thinking. So I thought that that was very clever. It was very cool to see. And they also made Linus not like, conventionally attractive. Really driving home the fact that you cannot judge a book by its cover. Overall, this book was like life-changing, literally life-changing. It was so incredible. I was initially reading it on my Kindle, but it was so good I had to get the actual copy. And the copy that I have is just so beautiful. I think I have it here, hold on. Yeah, I have it here. And just look how beautiful it is. It is the perfect book. If you don't read anything else that I say from this review, this is the book. This is the book you have to read. It literally made me cry at so many different points. It was just so beautiful. Also, you know what? I have some highlights that I kept from Goodreads that I could just show you just so that you can see how incredible it is. If you wanna see all my highlights from the book though, you can just follow my Goodreads. I'm getting emotional just reading it. But this quote here, this was one of the ones that were so impactful for me. Now this was a excerpt written by one of the children. Now at this point, Linus is sitting in on one of the classes for the children and one of the shy students had to come up and read something that he wrote and this is what he wrote. I am but paper, brittle and thin. I am held up to the sun and it shines right through me. I get written on and I can never be used again. These scratches are a history, they're a story. They tell things for others to read, but they only see the words and not what the words are written upon. I am but paper and though there are many like me, none are exactly the same. I am parched parchment. I have lines, I have holes. Get me wet and I melt. Light me on fire and I burn. Take me in hardened hands and I crumble. I tear, I am but paper, brittle and thin. And when this kid, oh my God, I'm gonna cry. When this kid finally started to open up and you heard what he went through, I was literally ready to fight anyone at all costs for his happiness and to make sure that he was never hurt again. And this book was literally one of the best things I have ever read. It was just so beautiful. This is definitely a book that can stand the test of time. I'll probably read it a hundred times before I die, hopefully. <laughs> Next up on our list was Seven Days in June, and this is a book that I read in one of our 24-hour reading vlogs, and man, this was good. This was good. It was so different from the type of romances that I usually read, but in a very, very good way. I gave it a four-star rating, and this book was about two black main characters, which I just absolutely love. They're both writers, and they knew each other when they were younger, and then they abruptly stopped talking to each other. You figure out why as you start reading the story. And man, it just talked about so many deep and complex issues. I was very taken aback, but it was very interesting. Like, I don't know if I would have wanted to read the book before if I knew what it was about, because it was just so many complex things and I'm really glad that I went into it blind because I was already committed to the characters after a while and their character development was really enticing so all in all I really enjoyed the book if there's anything that could be triggering to you please look up the trigger warnings because they kind of talk about everything in this book so just be aware of that but overall it was a solid read again I gave it four stars I don't know if it's something that I would want to read again or if it really holds up to that four star standard I think looking back at it now I think it's more of a like 3.75 star book 
but I'm just gonna leave it as a four. It was very, very good. Just, I don't think I would want to read it again. But it did open my eye to something. Because the characters were black main characters, they started speaking and experiencing life in a way that was familiar to me, and that was so refreshing. And it made me realize that I don't read enough books with black main characters. So from here on out, I wanna be more intentional about the books that I pick up and make sure that I have some of those in my repertoire. Because as of right now, or previously, I didn't have any. But ever since then, I've been trying trying to buy more books with black main characters or about black culture. So that was very cool to see as well. I feel like I grew a lot as a reader. Also, side note, I know you see my awesome light on my desk. This is a light that I got from Devoom. It's really cool because it just has the prettiest colors. I don't know if you can see it. Let's see. Let me see if I can pick a different color. Either way, you can try different colors and different themes, and it's so nice because when I'm studying, I'm sitting at the desk all by myself, and it's just nice to have this ambiance there with you. It's also an alarm clock, which is really nice too. But if this isn't your thing, they also have another one, and this is just the cutest little thing ever. She's a little loud, but it's so cute. You can put the time here. You can also do like different games and you can put different backgrounds. You can even make backgrounds because it has its own app and it's really nice. It's been so cute. I feel like all the study girlies have this. And then when I saw this, I was like, you know what? I, <laughs> you know what? I just have to get it. It's just so cute. And I think I'm gonna give one of these to my little sister cause I don't need both, but they're both really adorable. So I'm gonna let her pick whichever one she wants. Now enough of that, let's go to book number five. Before the Coffee Gets Cold is the fifth book on our list and also the first book that I read in August. And I gotta say, I was kind of disappointed. I didn't rate it badly. I give it three out of five stars, which isn't terrible. It's just an average book. But I really went into it with high hopes because everyone said it was a really good book. Now this book is all about a magical cafe in Tokyo. So you go in there and there's a special seat in that cafe where you can time travel. And you can only go there for a few minutes. There's a ton of rules. You have to sit in that seat. You have to wait until this ghost lady gets up. It's like a whole thing. But a lot of people do it and each chapter is about a specific character in the book. Now that layout I really enjoyed because it was a nice way of seeing how each person was connected and interconnected and also their life story. So I really enjoyed that part. But I can't say that I enjoyed the writing. I don't know, it was just very mundane and matter of fact. It sounded almost monotone. Like there was no real emotion in the book and a lot of it felt like more conservative than I think naturally we are in certain situations like that. So it was kind of not off-putting, but just like, I felt like there was distance between the emotion and the actual events that were taking place. So I didn't really enjoy that because I felt like if there was more human emotion, more intention behind what was said and like vulnerability, it would have allowed us as the reader to really delve into the story a bit more and to connect with the characters. Now that isn't to say that I didn't connect with the characters because I absolutely did. Like some of the stories are really fascinating to me, but I felt like it could have been so much more. That's all. Don't shoot the messenger. It's still an okay book. I would recommend it to people if it's like a very specific niche they're looking for, but it's not something I would readily think of if someone was asking for a recommendation. So not bad, but not great either. <laughs> Now for the next book, we kind of keep that same pace. I read Beach Read, which I also gave a three out of five stars. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I don't like Emily Henry's writing or I just can't read her books during readathons because this is the second book of hers that I read and I just gave it a three stars. I thought it was average. I thought it was okay. But I'm really thinking that because her books are so character driven and there's so many complex details in every book, I think I really need to sit down and read them when I'm not sleep deprived. So it really could be me. So I think it's only fair for me to give Miss Emily Henry another chance. I think I'm going to get happy place and just read that normally. Just see if I like her reading when I'm coherent and I'm going through each phase very slowly. So we'll see how that works out. That's going to be my experiment for Emily Henry. If I don't end up liking happy place, I think it's fair to say it's a wrap for her because this is now the third book I spent money on and I'm not really connecting to her characters. But back to Beach Read. Beach Read is all about this writer. Her name is January and she is your cliche hopeless romantic or she was until there was a family issue with her dad and she realized that not everything is what it looks like. Then she goes and lives in a summer house by a beach 
also near another writer that she's known for a while, but he writes completely differently. He writes literary fiction where almost all of his main characters die. They're very polar opposite. She's like Labrador and he's like black cat type of energy at first, but then you see they kind of slowly mix the two together in each character, which is really nice to see because I felt like at first she was dealing with a lot of hurt, but then there was a lot of character development, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I think overall, it was an okay love story. I didn't think it was like all consuming. I wasn't obsessed with their love story, but there was one main takeaway that I took from this book and that was like the power of forgiveness and knowing the difference between like a bad person and someone who did a bad thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person. They could have just made a bad decision. So that was really interesting to see. And I loved seeing her come to that realization and kind of mature a bit as an adult because there's always room to grow as an adult. You never stop growing. And this was a hard lesson she had to learn the hard way. So I thought that was really nice to see. And I loved how Emily summed up the entire story. I thought it was very cute. It was a very nice bow on the whole situation. And it was a solid read. Again, not amazing. I'm still waiting on a four or five star from Emily, but as of right now, it was just average and I didn't mind it. I didn't hate it. It was a little lengthy though. I felt like a few things were drawn out more than they had to be. But again, I read that for a 24 hour reading vlog, so it could just be me. I'm going to try again with her other books. Next up is Instructions for Dancing by Nicole Yoon. Now this book I gave four stars. It's not my favorite from her, but it was still very, very good. This book is all about Evie. She's this high schooler who is obsessed with love until her dad and her mom divorce, and they had a really nasty split and you kind of figure out why. And from there, she's very skeptical with love. But as that is happening, she develops these new powers where when anyone kisses, she can see the beginning of their relationship all the way to the end of their relationship. So so it's really tough because obviously as you can see all she's seeing is people break up all the time so it reinforces her idea that you know what love isn't really real anyway and that is until she starts taking this dance class with Xavier and he's this really cool punk rock kid that does like music on the side he completely shatters her idea that not everyone can find love and he slowly starts to open her up and realize she's just hurt she doesn't necessarily not believe in love anymore she's just had her idea of love kind of be remolded because of the situation that she went through with her parents and now she's seeing a positive light of love and this book was very fast paced it was very cute and it just made me really appreciate nicole yoon as a writer because i realized this was the last book of hers that she's written in a while and i realized after reading all three of her books she always has a hidden agenda it's never just about romance there's always a parallel story running along the same romance and it's always about a deeper meaning within life and I just love that you never really know what you're gonna get with one of her books and it really made me appreciate her as a complex writer because that takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort to be that intentional with your writing so it just made me love her even more again it wasn't bad but it wasn't my favorite now last but not least is remarkably bright creatures this is a book that i'm actually still currently reading but by the time this video comes out i'm pretty sure i'll have finished it so i'll put my rating here and we can just talk about the book so as of right now the book is all about this lady her name is tova she's in her later years in life and she just lost her husband and before that, she lost her son 18 years ago to this freak accident. No one still knows what happened. So she's kind of just running away from her grief and she's still trying to find jobs that will allow her to stay busy because she's pretty well off. Like she's got enough savings. She doesn't have to work anymore. She's like in her early 70s and yet she's still working because she just needs to keep busy. She needs to stay away from the depressing reality that she's kind of on her own now. She only had that one child. He unfortunately disappeared so early on in his life and then she just just lost her husband so Tova's just trying to keep busy and as she's trying to keep herself busy she takes this job at the aquarium where she basically just cleans up the place but while she's there she meets Marcellus which is the great Pacific octopus there and he is just so witty and so adorable he doesn't outright speak obviously they try to tether to a little bit of reality but you can hear his thoughts in the story and that was really cool for me but I think that it was very surprising because it made me realize like animal captivity can be really really grueling on them and that's something that i think we all have pretty much understood but it really makes you ponder like how ethical animal captivity is because throughout the whole book he's like missing his natural habitat and no animals were harmed in this book so far that i know but still like it makes you wonder uh how many animals or how many creatures actually feel this way if they 
you know, do have some sense of feeling and stuff like that. It just made me kind of feel icky about being a human, you know? <laughs> but Marcellus comes into play in this story because he kind of discovers what happened to her son. And it helps that this new kid, he's like in his 30s, his name is Cameron. He comes and he works at the aquarium as well. And at first, I absolutely hated Cameron. Cameron was single-handedly ruining this book for me because he was so lazy and every single time something went wrong, he would immediately blame it on someone else. He would never take accountability. And that was just so off-putting to me. It was just like, ew. It was so many obvious situations and scenarios where he would obviously be in the wrong, but he would blame someone else. And I'm like, sir, we're too old to be acting like this, to be thinking this way. You gotta grow up. I understand you didn't have the best childhood, but at a certain point, you have to take the autonomy for your own life and you have to make the decisions for your own life to change how your life began. Like, just because you started in a rough situation doesn't mean your life has to end that way. And that is all up to you and your decisions that you make. It's not everyone else. You can't blame everyone else. But he continuously blamed everyone else for his problems. He could never keep a job. He never had any money. He was terrible in relationships. He was just constantly like dragging himself through life. But as he moves from California and all the way back to Washington or all the way to Washington to take this job uh, at the aquarium because he was also looking for something else in his life. When he goes there, he really starts to develop as a man, as a character. And it was really refreshing to see him like try to take more accountability for himself, try to grow up a little bit more. So, so far that's as far as I've gotten and it's really starting to get really good because now we're starting to see how things are connecting and I'm very interested to see how things play out. Overall, it's a solid read, but I'm not gonna lie, the first 100 pages really got me because he was just constantly complaining and I was afraid that this book that everyone has rated really highly was gonna end up being a flop for me. So we'll see, I still have pretty high hopes because things are starting to pick up but the beginning wasn't that great for me. Now, that is all the books that I read in both July and August. Not a bad list, I feel like. I feel like there was nothing worse than a three-star read, which isn't terrible. I'm pretty happy about that. But I really hope that the fall has way more four and five-star reads to come. All right, guys, that's it for me. I love you so much, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.